Hello, everyone. Thanks for being with us today. Uh, my name is Melanie Blake, and I am the director of Classical Pursuits. And I'm here with Rick Phillips, one of our longtime leaders who at Toronto Pursuits 2023 will be leading a seminar on the pianist and composer Rachmaninoff. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Toronto Pursuits, this is a, an event that we've been holding at the University of Toronto since 1999, so almost 25 years. And Rick has been a part of it, I think, for almost that long. Rick, not, not quite, but 20, for quite a while. 20 years. 20 years. Okay, okay. Yeah. And um, some of you may know Rick from um, Sound Advice, the show he had on CBC Radio, um, and from his long career in Toronto and beyond as um, a, a radio host, um, a producer, a music educator, uh, a music writer. All, Rick, you're you're always doing all kinds of all kinds of activities. So busy, <laughs> and uh, so we're very grateful to Rick for uh, for every summer being with us at Toronto Pursuits to offer a seminar on music. And this year, as I mentioned, Rick will be with us from July 16th to 21st at the University of Toronto, leading a seminar on Sergei Rachmaninoff. And we're here today just so that if you don't know Rick, you can meet with him, learn a little bit about what's going to happen in the seminar, and to talk a little bit about Rachmaninoff himself. So Rick, as I was telling you before, um, I, so you know, Rick, that I played the, I, I played the viola all through my childhood and adolescence and young adulthood and um, very much enjoyed, for example, playing the music of Tchaikovsky. And it wasn't until later in my life and in, in the case of Rachmaninoff, uh, reading about him as I was thinking about your seminar to learn that Tchaikovsky and especially Rachmaninoff have this mixed reputation and there's a, there's a tension there between uh, between perhaps musicians and the public, and but among musicians and among among the public too, about what people think of Rachmaninoff. Why is his reputation this way? Why is it so mixed? Well, you're absolutely right. It is mixed, and it continues to be mixed. Although I, I would say that today, here in the early years of the 21st century, the first couple of decades of the 21st century, I think we've passed it, and I think that. For the most part, I mean, there will always be people that don't like it. It's just like there are people who don't like WC. But uh, for the most part, I think Rachmaninoff is accepted today. But that, as you say, Melanie, that wasn't always the case. Of course, he grew up, he's, we're, we're celebrating him this year because he was born in 1873 and he died in 1943. So it's the 150th anniversary of his birth and the 80th anniversary of his death. They fall together uh, this year. And, you know, the New York Philharmonic and the Los Angeles Philharmonic and the Philadelphia Orchestra and all kinds of orchestras in Europe, the Berlin Philharmonic and so on, are celebrating him with festivals of his music, which 100 years ago probably wouldn't happen. Even 75 years ago, it wouldn't happen. What happened with Rachmaninoff was he was schooled in the 19th century romantic Russian tradition of Tchaikovsky, as you mentioned, Rimsky-Korsakov, Mussorgsky, all of those wonderful late uh, 19th century Russian composers. And he wrote, he continued that line. He really is looked at as the continuation of the Russian line of Tchaikovsky and Rimsky-Korsakov. And it goes well into the 20th century when musical tastes started to change, right? As we get into the 20th century, we start to get Impressionism, Debussy and Ravel. We start to get Serialism with Arnold Schoenberg, Alban Berg, and Anton Webern. Uh, there are many other isms that come up uh, in nationalism and so on. And Rachmaninoff tended to stay away from all of those. He wrote in a style that he was comfortable with and that he was good at. And, and that was the style that he presented. And it became unpopular because as we moved into the 20th century musical styles, particularly the, the tastes of the musical intelligentsia and the musical establishment felt, well, you know, romantic music, we had 100 years of that in the 19th century. Now we're looking into other things like Impressionism and Serialism and all the other isms and so on, primitivism and right, so on. Right. And Rachmaninoff still uh, maintained it. So 
Uh, he was frowned upon as, uh, well, here's the, here's the statement from the Groves Dictionary of Music and Musicians, which as you probably know, you probably remember is sort of the gold standard of musical dictionaries in the yeah. 20th century. And they called them monotonous in texture, consisting mainly of artificial and gushing tunes. His popularity is not likely to last. This was in a dictionary of music. When you look up Rachmaninoff, that's what you get. The other one that I love is from a Boston reviewer who wrote about the second piano concerto, arguably Rachmaninoff's most popular work today. Quote, it might have been written by any German, technically well-trained, who was acquainted with the music of Tchaikovsky. I mean, talk about damning with faint praise. <laughs> was acquainted with the music of Tchaikovsky. In other words, you can fake this stuff, right? It's not Germanic, though. It's not well-constructed like German music. It's gushing and so on. So that's what he was kind of faced with. The public tended to love him. They tended to like him. But the critics and the reviewers and the musical establishment uh, didn't. Well, as time went, also his music was banned in the Soviet Union. He left in 1917 at the Russian Revolution, never returned, and settled eventually in Beverly Hills, California, of all places. But the Soviet Union banned his music during uh, the Stalin era, uh, in, during the 1930s, because they looked at it as decadent and bourgeoisie and middle class and uh, Western influenced and all that sort of stuff. So they banned it for a number of years. And it was also banned or not banned, but frowned upon by the music establishment outside of the Soviet Union. But the public liked it. But you heard things of that it was overripe and undercooked and all of those kind of uh, metaphors and so on were all there. But as we moved into the end of the 20th century, and into the 21st century, things started to change because we now started to want music that was more melodic and more capital R romantic like they had had in the 19th century. Those musical styles came back and Rachmaninoff was well suited for a rebirth or a rediscovery of his music. It's also brilliant piano music. So as we got into um, uh, competitions in music during the 20th century, the Moscow, the Tchaikovsky International Piano Competition, the Chopin, the Gina Bacar, the Montreal International. These are all major music competitions. As we got into those, uh, entrants, young people uh, would, would play Rachmaninoff in their, you know, round one or round two or round three and so on. And many of them would win. And the reason for that is if you can play Rachmaninoff, it's impressive. It's, he was a brilliant pianist and he wrote for his own talents. And if you can match those talents, it's pretty showy, it's, it's flashy stuff. And these young people started winning piano competitions by playing Rachmaninoff. Well, it falls down then that the teachers of these young people wanting their students to win the piano competitions would start to put the Rachmaninoff into the curriculum so that they could maybe play in a, in a competition and my name, the teacher's name would be mentioned and so on. It gets into politics, right? Uh, for example, money. when I was a student at McGill in the early 1970s, it was really frowned upon. Uh, you know, oh, why don't you play some Beethoven or Brahms, not Rachmaninoff. I remember my teachers saying that. And about 20, 20 years later, it had come all around and was well accepted and was being teach, being taught in the conservatories, being performed on the uh, in the competitions and so on. And today we see festivals of his music. So he's really come around mainly because of politics and the change in musical tastes. Now this all started to happen around the end of the war, end of World War II. And there are a number of uh, examples where they took the music of Rachmaninoff and put some, you know, sentimental or love-like lyrics to it. And uh, Frank Sinatra would record it, or Eric Carmen, and so on. And this also brought that music to another public, where they realized that the gift for melody that Ch that uh, Rachmaninoff had was really something. And the example I have here is a good one, I think, that uh, uh, a lot of his music, you'll remember, uh, uh, Melanie, from your basic musical training on the viola, that in a sonata form or a symphony or a concerto, the first part of the work is all where the composer lays out the raw material. Right. There's usually two themes, right? The first theme is usually the energetic one, uh, you know, that grabs your attention and it's energetic and fast and so on. And then you sort of wind down into the second theme, which is invariably in contrast. It's lyrical, it's warm, it's tender. 
And just about all of the hits of Rachmaninoff are the second themes, not the first one. It's the lyrical. It's true, uh, right? <laughs> Those are the ones that, that are the memorable ones. So here's an example from the Piano Concerto Number no. 2, again, arguably one of his most popular works. And the second theme is a big popular one. I've got it queued up to the piano. Let's just have a listen to it. Okay, that's probably enough. You get the idea. It may seem familiar. Now, in 1945, it was uh, rearranged and put the, a guy called Buddy K put some lyrics to it, and rather lush, sentimental lyrics. And Frank Sinatra recorded it, and it was a huge hit in 1945. Let's have a listen to that. It's got a kind of a about a 10 or 15 second intro with the orchestra, and then Frank will come in with the two. Full moon and empty arms The moon is there for us to share But where are you? Okay, there is. that could be enough maybe uh, for you. I, I, the lyrics are by Buddy K, who was a pretty pretty popular songwriter in the war and the lyrics are full moon and empty arms the moon is there for us to share but where are you i don't know i think that maybe you and i could write better lyrics than this but it was at <laughs> the time right that was what they're yeah, looking yeah. for and this was a huge hit uh, perry como had another hit later that year till the end of time which is a rearrangement with lyrics of a polonaise by chopin so this this whole theme of you know taking classical music and turning it into pop music was nothing new. But Frank Sinatra had a good hit on uh, with Full Moon and Empty Arms. In the 70s, Eric Carmen came up with All By Myself, Never Gonna Fall in Love Again. I don't have I don't we don't have the time for that uh, right now, but we could hear them when in my seminar with Toronto Pursuits. And those were also hits. You know, the melodies are great, there's no question. And one of the traits of Rachmaninoff is the melodies go on for pages. If you're looking at, you know, Mozart or Beethoven, the melodies tend to be four, eight, 12, maybe 16 bars. Here, they're like four, eight, 12 pages, right? They go on and on forever. And that's one of his uh, great traits is this endless sense of melody. So, I mean, that's uh, kind of where we are now is we've come full circle and now he's incredibly popular and everybody's doing festivals and there's books and articles and recordings and all kinds of being done this, all kinds of things being done this year to celebrate the 150th of the birth and the 80th of the death. And that's really the, the reason I thought, well, let's do it at Toronto Pursuits. Let's uh, take a, you know, an in-depth look and look at not just the piano music, which is his most popular, but you know, we've got three operas, we've got symphonies, uh, we've got uh, choral music, fantastic Russian choral music steeped in the Russian traditions and so on. So I just thought, let's look at this and look at him from a 21st century perspective without maybe the colorings and the musical politics that have clouded us before. That's what Rick, if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, we're, you're also going to, the group will also be listening to uh, Rachmaninoff playing his own compositions as well. One of the great things about uh, looking into Rachmaninoff is he recorded quite a bit. He was a very popular pianist and he recorded about 10 or 11 hours of music for the RCA Victor Company. That was his label, which we still have. And of course, through digital technology, you can clean those up quite a bit so that they don't have all of the pops and ticks and the frying of steak in the background that you usually have with recordings from the, you know, the 20s, 30s, 40s, and so on. So yes, we will be listening to a fair amount of Rachmaninoff and comparing his recordings with others today. You know, you could compare his performance of a piece by uh, himself with Daniel Trifonov, one of the one of the great Russian pianists that's working today. And we can compare and look at how styles and, and moods and ways of doing things have changed. And that's always interesting too, a very enlightening uh, uh, topic. Yeah, we'll be doing that too. 
Great. Yes. And for those of you who um, aren't familiar with uh, being with Rick in seminar, um, you don't have to read music or play music to to join him in seminar. Um, and you it's it's a great opportunity, whether you have a lot of musical knowledge or or little or none at all, because no matter where you are, I think I, I know from, from myself, um, just interacting with Rick, you become a more a more astute um, and um, a more a, a better listener of music um, while having a lot of a lot of fun and, and learning a lot. And Rick, I know you're you know, we we um, we're going to try to listen to Rachmaninoff with a fresh ear. But those of you who have been with Rick before know that and as you've as we've just talked about a little bit be here here there's the music and then there's all the culture and the politics and the con and the context and Rick always brings that together so so beautifully because um music like no no art is in a vacuum right it's uh, that's you, right you yeah, can't separate they can't uh, separate all the other things um, there's always a message or there's something to comment on and yeah there's lots in Rachmaninoff too yeah and did you so Rick did you enjoy uh playing Rachmaninoff? Uh, uh, yes and no. Okay. Uh, I mean, yes, I enjoyed playing Rachmaninoff, but I never played it like I wanted to, you know. It's it's incredibly difficult piano music and you know, I tried to play it as well as I could and I remember playing it on a couple of exams in university. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I I it's it's tricky. It's hard stuff to play and very demanding. Uh, and so I never got to the point where I wanted to perform publicly. No. Right, right. And was that mostly because because I and for all of you who are watching here today, um, we'll, I'm going to put this in our newsletter, and I have a, I also have a Facebook video that I found that talks a little bit about his famous hand span. Um, and, and was that the was? I guess my question, Rick, is what was there one thing that in particular that made playing his music so difficult, or was it a common? Well, no, there, there's all kinds of things, but you've touched on them, uh, Melanie, in that he was a pianist who wrote for himself. So he wrote for his own hand. He had a hand that could span a 12th. If you go over to a piano and count out 12 white notes, his hand could stretch that. My hand here can stretch a ninth. So you can imagine that, you know, it would be another three white notes here. That would be the 12th. So it's very difficult for anybody who doesn't have a hand that can span a 12th to play a 12th, right? So you tend to break things. You know, if you have a chord, instead of playing it all simultaneously, you roll it so that you can hit all of the notes, but he would have played them together. They would have been all played together. A very, very uh, a large hand and an incredibly agile hand. He had a brilliant technique. There were really no weaknesses in it throughout the left hand or the right hand. And that's a lot of the difficulty of his music is it's technically very challenging, as well as then there's the musicality and the art form and the form and the structure and all of that other stuff that you've got to deal with as well. So it's very challenging music for any pianist to play. Yeah. So, and Rick, for somebody like as of course, so Yuja Wong famously, she did the the marathon, I think in January at Carnegie Hall with the Philadelphia Orchestra. Would, would she be breaking up those chords? Or, yes. Uh, yeah, okay. Yuja, Yuja Wong, you've seen her. She's a tiny little, Asian, yeah, yeah. you know, uh, the other one that comes to mind is the great Spanish, late Spanish pianist, Alicia de la Rocha, was a little woman about five feet tall. She played the Rachmaninoff concertos brilliantly. And yet she had a tiny little hand, but she was able to, you could say fake it, but it's so common in Rachmaninoff that it's not really faking. It's it's making the music work for you. Mm -hmm. If we only had pianists who had hands like Rachmaninoff play this music, we would rarely hear it. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, yeah. Rick, anything else you wanted to say before before we head out? I don't think so, Melanie. I mean, you've met, uh, you got on the uh, website the concert with the uh, Dover String Quartet on the Wednesday with the Toronto Summer Music Festival. I'll be talking about that after lunch on the Wednesday. Very interesting program, uh, some traditional and some contemporary, uh, all for string quartet. But uh, no, I think that we've covered a lot of bases, and uh, I'm really looking forward to it. I've uh, I've loved Rachmaninoff, always have, and uh, really looking forward to spending some time with uh, likewise uh, music lovers. Yes, and so again, everyone, uh, Rick will be at Toronto Pursuits, which is at the University of Toronto from July 16th to 21st. Um, and then we'll have his seminar from uh, Monday to Friday, the 17th to the 21st. 
and he'll be, for those of you who have already signed up for Toronto Pursuits, but you're not in Rick's seminar, don't worry. As Rick mentioned, um, we, he will be giving a pre-concert talk. We are attending a talk on, uh, uh, we are attending a concert on July 19th. Um, I think this is a, the Isidore Quartet and- um, Oh, sorry, Isidore. Yeah, okay. No, Dover Quartet, we did do, we did see the Dover Quartet. We did that, we did that, didn't we? Uh, yeah. And, um, but so that's part of your program. Um, and we'll also be um, including in our afternoon program some some sessions with another musician, a saxophonist, Daniel Rubinoff, um, who's going to in, um, in his sessions to try to bring in some Rachmaninoff as well to complement what Rick is doing. Um, so lots of opportunities for you to uh, explore not only literature, of course, at Toronto Pursuits, but music and have a lot of fun doing it here in excellent hands with Rick. Um, we, I know that his seminar participants always have a lot of fun. You can find more information on our website, classicalpursuits.com and go to the Toronto Pursuits page. If you have any questions, uh, please feel free to contact us. Uh, you can contact us directly from the website or email us at info at classicalpursuits.com. Uh, we'd love to see you there, uh, along with Rick and all of our other leaders. And thank you, Rick, for, for speaking with me today. Pleasure, and Ellie. I'm going to go listen to some records. <laughs> okay, me too. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Rick. Bye. Have a good day. Bye-bye.